Well, hello and welcome to the second edition of Mark's Mail, uh, where I answer your questions. I do like doing the daily briefings and in the comments section quite often people will ask various questions and sometimes I'm able to answer those questions right away or with just a brief, uh, a brief reply in the comments section. But other times some of these questions take a little bit more explanation and that's what the mailbag here is for. So welcome to the second edition. Fresh mail, fresh from the mailbox right here. So let's get started. The first one comes from a good friend of, uh, of Mark Fine and Weather on YouTube from Juan Brown. Juan, thanks for the question. Asked about morning ground clutter on radar and what causes that. And a couple of days ago, we had some morning thunderstorms and I was showing that on radar. As a matter of fact, I can show you that. And this goes back to uh, September 3rd. Remember, we had some thunderstorms in the morning right in here. But the question was, well, what's all of this? Now, this is the hours in the middle of the night, 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And you do see a lot of this ground clutter. So this isn't rain. And if you're looking at this, it may be tough to distinguish, well, what's the real rain and what's the ground clutter? Like, what's this here along Highway 49, lower foothills? Well, this is ground clutter. So what happens is when we have... The morning hours, the early morning hours, have an inversion. So this is where the radar site is here. I'm showing you the radar from Davis. So the beam goes out, but we have an inversion. So that means we have cooler air at the surface, warmer air aloft. And as the beam goes straight out, it does get bent down as it reaches the warmer layer of the atmosphere. So it gets bent down and then bounces off the ground. And especially here, as you can see right here along, what is that, maybe about five to 700 feet here. We also have it a little bit farther out here into uh, Yolo County and Calusa County. And then of course, this shows up quite a bit and a lot of people ask about these quite a bit. Th these are here all the time because that is windmills and so are these. These are windmills down here uh, by Altamont Pass and that sort of thing. And then we get the traffic on I-5 that also shows up. So you can see these patterns of things that uh, are almost always there. And then during the day, we see the, the morning ground clutter actually go away, but it's because of the inversion. And as the sun comes up and you get rid of the inversion, then the ground clutter goes away. And of course, it's always easier too when you're watching moving radar to see that, yeah, this is moving, so of course that is rain, and this isn't moving, but it is, well, just windmills. So I hope that helps. So yeah, uh, the, between windmills and inversions, you can get a lot of things on radar that, uh, that aren't really there and it can be uh, a bit confusing. So Juan, I hope that helps. So Eagle149 says, uh, why was the weather term rainfall season and rainfall year, uh, which was July 1st through June 30th, which is used for 100 years and to record rainfall statistics dropped in 2015 by the NWS and lumped in with the water supply term water year, which is October 1st through September 30th. Yeah, you know, that um, Eagle, that, that, that kind of always bothered me as well. For one thing, we have records going back, you know, more than 100 years that show the rain season. And even though it isn't that much different in terms of, of what the numbers are, there are slight variations so what they did is it, they wanted to be more in line with DWR, I believe. I think that was the reasoning. Um, and so they used October 1st. Now, of course, in Northern California, we don't get much rain between July, August, and September. So it really doesn't make that much of a difference. But I just always found it annoying as well because we do have a long, long list of records. So, um, yeah, I, I believe it was so they could come in line uh, a little bit better with... Um, with the DWR. Uh, let's see, next up is uh, Mike McKenzie. Uh, what makes forecasting the weather on the West Coast difficult or unique to any other region? That's a good question. Let me, um, let me go over to here. Let me show you this. So for a long time, um, we always thought that, no, I don't want that one, I want this one. I don't want this one, I want this one. There we go. Uh, 
So for a long time, it was always thought that uh, forecasting here on the West Coast was much more difficult because we didn't get as much um, information into the models. And that is still somewhat true. What you're looking at here is where all the sites across the United States where weather balloons are launched twice a day. And there are a couple hundred of these and also imported into the, uh, into the models are also uh, information that is derived from satellites, information that is derived from radars, as well as surface data. Hourly surface data is also incorporated. But the 12Z and 0Z runs uh, also incorporate all of this weather balloon data. And this data goes from the surface up to about 100,000 feet. So a, a vertical sampling, let's say, out of uh, Salt Lake City or out of Oakland or out of Reno. And so obviously, if you, have, you, you don't have that out here in the Pacific, it's thought that you, making the forecasting here would be more difficult. But I'll tell you, with more... Uh, with more information being derived from satellites, I've seen the models get better for West Coast weather forecasting. Now, one of the things that makes the forecasting difficult on the West Coast, or certainly a challenge, is the interaction between a relatively cool Pacific with temperatures in the 50s, and then the extreme terrain that we go into. First, we have uh, the, the coastal range, if you will. Let's say in California, you have the coastal range. Then we have a central valley, which is almost back down to sea level. And then, we, of course, we have the Sierra that goes up to 10,000 feet and higher. So between extreme geography as well as a cold ocean, um, that can make the forecasting uh, difficult here. But I will tell you, um, Mike, that, that forecasting the weather just about everywhere has its own idiosyncrasies. And so, well, um, you know, forecasting here on the West Coast is difficult. I think forecasting in New England is difficult. Forecasting in Florida or Texas is probably also uh, quite difficult. And I've often thought that if I all of a sudden, when I was working in television and, you know, I've worked in Sacramento, you know, 30 years, if all of a sudden I get transplanted to, let's say, a place like Denver or Minneapolis, in many ways, I'd feel like I was starting all over. So we, uh, there, is, there is a lot to regional forecasting. And experience really helps. But in terms of the big picture and what helps the models, it's that sounding data that really helps. But also satellite data is really improving to make those models a lot better. Uh, Sonora S uh, Susan Smith says, I have a question for you. I see, uh, is the quote unquote, see the lightning count 1000, etc. cetera, uh, until you hear thunder, a good way of estimating how far the strikes are away from you. Um, I always always taught that. And yes, that, that is somewhat true, although the exact amount of time um, varies from what theory you believe. Uh, but because light, of course, travels a lot faster than sound, what the estimate is, you count in seconds and then you divide that by four or five. And then that, that's your estimate in miles. But keep in mind, that's just an estimate. And the, all, the other thing to keep in mind for lightning is... You can have lightning and then, of course, you see the flash and then, then, you know, seconds later you get the thunder. But the problem is, and for lightning safety, is that just because that strike was five miles away, it doesn't mean the next strike isn't going to be a quarter mile away from you. Because the, if you look at a thunderhead, there can be a number of places where the lightning is coming out. Um, so... Yeah, that's why uh, they, when they, what the, the saying is, when thunder roars, go indoors. Uh, because you, what you don't want to be doing is saying, oh, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. Oh, that, that's still two miles away, and, and that's going to take forever to get here. No, 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 no. You, you don't do that. But, but yeah, it's because the difference between the, the um, speed of light and the speed of sound, that there is that gap in between seeing them. And obviously, when you hear them simultaneously, yeah, or you hear and see it simultaneously. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's basically right on top of you. Okay, uh, sail to surf. Good question here. Good uh, meteorological weather question. I don't know how to ask this properly. You're fine, um, but I'd like some explanation of the atmosphere. How thick is it? I think I heard the 500 millibar level is 18,000 feet, roughly. Yeah, that's good. I also heard half of the atmosphere is above this line and half below. Hmm. 
When I fly a passenger jet at, let's say, 35,000 feet, the weather slash clouds are usually below us. Is this generally true? Generally. A spy plane can fly at 60,000 feet, so there must be some atmosphere there. And how about the International Space Station? Do they have aerodynamic drag there? How far up are weather satellites? Uh, it seems I think about it, at least from the perspective of a weather satellite, all the weather action occurs in a very thin slice of the atmosphere just above the ground. Mm -hmm. And yet it can be very complex with different wind directions, etc. So um, for, to answer a couple of your questions, uh, the space station is about 250 miles up. And the satellites that we show, there are, there are a number of different weather satellites, but the satellites that we show most of the time are satellites that are in geosynchronous orbits. In other words, they stay over one place over the equator and they just go at the same space, uh, the same same time as the Earth is rotating. That's called the geosynchronous air, um, orbit. And that's just a little above 22,000 feet. Let's take a look at the atmosphere. And this is from NCAR. And these are the, the layers of the atmosphere. So we live down here in the troposphere. And you see a little sample of a cumulonimbus cloud here. And then you have a weather balloon. Weather balloons go up to roughly um, 100,000 feet or so. And then they're designed to burst. And then the, the equipment package falls back down. Um, as you can see, commercial jets are, are right around here, around 30 to 35,000 feet. And you're right. Most of the weather happens in this area here. Uh, well above that, you get into... Um, uh, sprites. I'd love to see some sprites sometimes. Those come out of uh, thunderstorms. Uh, Noctilucent clouds are way up in here. And then you have things like meteors that happen well up here around uh, 30 to 50 miles uh, miles up. So that's one view of, that's the big view of the atmosphere, if you will. But yeah, if you look at the, the before you get to the thermosphere, you're up here 50 miles, and then the, the space station is up 200 miles higher than that. But if you really look at the weather, everything happens down here in the troposphere. The stratosphere uh, really doesn't produce much weather. There are winds up here, but down here in the troposphere, that's where we live. And this is the traditional sounding that I show you from time to time, and this is a good view of that. And this is what you're talking about in terms of the wind and the temperature changing in height. And we measure this in millibars. So at 500 millibars or around um, 18,000 feet, 700 millibars or around 10,000 feet, uh, 850 millibars or down around 500, uh, 5,000 feet rather. So, uh, so this is what we look at in terms of the, the lower part of the atmosphere. Um, but again, what you're looking at here for the diagram of the atmosphere, this is, uh, that's how it all looks all the way up to the thermosphere, uh, which goes up around 60 miles. Uh, let's see, I think I have one more here. Uh, let's see. Oh yes, uh, uh, where is it? Oh, um, uh, here's why I couldn't find it. I don't have a name attached to it. I, I, I apologize. Here's one, when a load deepens in the winter, you may have sustained wind of 45 gusts to 60 at Mather, where at the same time Davis could see sustained wind of 25 gusts to 40. I know the east side of the valley is more wind prone. Somewhat. It's one of our little, uh, little idiosyncrasies that we have here. Uh, let's go to, let's go to this. So let's just take a look at a map of Northern California. So what we have here it's, this is all terrain driven because you have mountains here and you have mountains here. And when you have a, a load developing off the coast and you have a wind that should be southwest, by the time it gets into the valley, it's south and actually a little southeast. And what you have, if a wind is coming this way, it sort of banks off the foothills, if you will. So the wind gets stronger here. It's compressed. A little bit so you have wide open area here and all of a sudden it's starting to hit some terrain and so it starts to getting com compressed so you do have stronger winds on the east side of the valley when you have a south and southeast wind however conversely when we have north winds then the north the strong north winds are on the west side of the valley especially in Calusa and Glen County and then sometimes also creeping into the mountainous areas of Lake County and Napa County 
So quite often when you get a north wind event, we're looking at these areas and you have very little wind in the foothills, whereas you get a storm coming in, you have the stronger winds on the east side of the valley. And it's all because it is all terrain driven. And, uh, and that has to do with, uh, with all sorts of wind directions that get localized. They, are, they tend to be uh, terrain driven, um, whether it's north winds, south winds, west winds, you get that in the Sierra. Um, you know, as wind goes around mountains and all that sort of thing. So that's everything I have for you for mailbag number two, your second edition there. If you have any questions, comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section. I'll get them, get around to them the next time around. I'll talk with you later.